Uh, we'll call the meeting to order for the Deerfield Elementary School Committee on uh, January 5th, 2022. Seems strange to say that. Um, it's 6.02 p.m. I will note that this meeting is being recorded and it is a virtual meeting uh, of the Elementary School Committee. So, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Um, the first order of business are the minutes of November 9th, 2021. Motion to approve. Seconded. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming no discussion, uh, so we'll take a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Uh, David Sharp? Yes. And Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. It is unanimous. 5 0. Uh, financial statement warrants. And uh, Shelly? Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. Yes, see you. Thank you. Uh, so I did send out an email that we do not have a formal financial update this month. Uh, I did send you the expense reports. I'm happy to take questions if you do have them. Um, the expense reports look a little different than they normally would this time of year because we're still trying to get payroll up and running. If you remember in September, I did explain that we were working on getting payroll into the database. So a lot of the salary lines right now you actually see don't have any expenditures because we're working on that process still. So um, otherwise, if you have regular expense questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, and we do have two months of warrants that were signed to report on. There were 23 totaling $262,305.19. Okay. So, well, thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Shelly? Nope. No. Okay. Well, that's good. Maybe we'll get to the budget section. But What's that? I said we may have some later on in the agenda. Oh, I would think on the budget section, and we, yeah. I would hope we would have some questions. So, well, um, why do you think we're all asleep or anything? <laughs> I notice we still have the principal's report at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, would you like to give your report now or later, Tina? <laughs> I'm flexible, whatever makes sense for you. Well, since it's on the agenda, let's have you do it. <laughs> all right. So it's a little lengthier than usual, so I apologize. We didn't get to meet in December, and we have so many things to brag about that happened at the school. And, you know, what a good place to do it, right? <laughs> um, so under professional development category, um, we have gathered staff superpowers, and we're fortunate to have a many in-house experts willing to share their superpowers and a staff that welcomes learning from each other. So moving forward in March, we are putting together a faculty meeting around, or PD, around supporting students who are struggling with reg regulation and have a trauma background. We also have the author of Cultivating Genius, Goldie Muhammad, returning on January 14th. Um, shout out to Meg Shulda for uh, getting her back here again. We extend, uh, we'll extend our learning and focus on our culturally responsive education from the fall as we dig deeper into the five pursuits or her goals to refer to of a historically responsive literacy framework that we're excited about seeing her again. Um, some general information uh, inspired by the Monty's March, an annual fundraiser for the Food Bank of Western Mass, our DES kindergarten student, students organized a march of their own. And they um, marched up and down our, our school collecting donations for the food bank, and they raised over $1,000. Um, we also would like to thank Yankee Candle for their generous donation. We are thankful they recognize the importance of education and fortunate to have them as a support. But we also wrapped up a UNICEF coin collection right before the break and our final count was $850, which includes a matching donation from, from a faculty member and um, a few other donations right after the holiday. A huge shout out to Gretchen Law for organizing that. 
Um, some of you are parents also, so you might have got my, uh, let's call it unpolished video showing everybody about our winter door. So just prior to break, we worked as a committee to infuse our building with winter cheer. The fire marshal was not here, so we got away with it. Um, students and educators enjoyed creating winter scenes on their classroom doors and admiring the creativity of their neighboring doors. <laughs> students also participated in a voting march and there was wing winners announced. We uh, and we even did share our fun with a with a video with our families. Shout out to Lori Roach for really organizing this and getting that up and going. I also would like to thank our diversity and leadership team because we have scheduled activities again for January 21st as we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Uh, Jen Smith, Lisa Gaylor, Giselle Richardson, Lori Conlin for supporting the DLT group and our students for leading the way. Um, I have some student news. I'm going through, I'm making sure I got that. Yep. So our classroom news. Um, in the fall, all our kindergarten classes enjoy learning and playing in our newly established outdoor classroom which they say felt a little bit more woodsy until the trees fell. So now they're spelling out, I mean, the lilies fell, so now they're spelling out a new spot. Um, our second grade uh, balance classroom has spent much of the fall term studying science and the college skills. Um, <laughs> they're funny. I'll let you read about that. Our fourth grade classrooms enjoyed a school field trip for the Cancania last month. And our best group, which is a group that works on social emotional learning, held a pet guide during December, and they gathered over 330 pounds worth of supplies for the animal shelter. Wow. Last, and perhaps most importantly, we would like to recognize Gretchen Law. Hi, Gretchen. I see. I know you're here. Um, after 33 years of service to the Deerfield Elementary School, she will begin her retirement later this month. Gretchen is admired for her ability to quickly build rapport and grab a hold of her learners, creating a safe and supportive environment where students take academic risks, learning as they go, and thriving under her instruction. She's able to coach the most reluctant learner to achieve her full potential. It seems she keeps a bit magical, but she's also a trusted colleague who steps up selflessly and without hesitation to support her peers. She's a five wing rock, which after being magical, maybe she's like a diamond because she sparkles. Um, she's always there when they're need when she's needed, and she quietly is waiting for those who choose to lean in with her. You could not ask for a more faithful, dedicated, and supportive colleague or friend. Okay, this is where it gets a little emotional. Gretchen will always have a home at DES, and she is truly going to be missed by her DES family. We love you, Gretch. <laughs> Thank you for that, Tina, and uh, obviously thank you, Gretchen, for your years of service, and um, we'll miss having you in the school, <clears throat> so, but you've got good things to look forward to, <clears throat> so thank you, Tina. Um, public comment. We have no public comment this evening that I'm aware of. Uh, I was not contacted with any, so we're into unfinished business and a COVID-19 update. Yeah, so what you guys hear? So, yeah, so we're in the middle of a spike, um, as we all kind of know. Um, I did send out some information to families. Um, just prior to our return, we did some of the major changes that we have done in the last few days is that we've gone to a dashboard approach um, to the uh, feedback that we see from parents that, you know, constantly receiving the same kind of form letter was not helpful. We want to have a better idea about what the numbers were and um, have more transparency what was happening. And that, with the anticipation of rising numbers, uh, we went to a dashboard approach, which was emailed out to all families and is also on are, it's on the central web page. Tina, is that your Deerfield page? I know Frontier has linked it to the central page, central office page, but if, if you can find it there under the COVID uh, materials. If you haven't seen, we'll probably put it on the website before. Anyway, um, the next thing uh, we also did is um, <coughs> there has been a change from CDC guidelines regarding how um, 
to treat what close contacts are and how long um, when people um, do get COVID, how long do they have to be out from school? And the CDC did reduce that to five days if you are um, non, you don't or do not have symptoms. And there's a whole kind of thing, and we have that um, on our website as well to explain. So that's kind of kind of changed things of how um, uh, how COVID is, is going through both staff members and um, students in our school. Um, we also um, are happy to report that there is a going to be a vaccination bus coming, um, another one, and for those in the community and um, students and those looking to get booster shots, um, you're going to be able to find that at Deerfield Elementary on uh, January 14th at 12:30. I'll be doing a push out of that information. I was supposed to get to that today. Didn't get to that, so it'll probably go out first thing tomorrow, um, unless Meg's doing it right now. So. Um, so yeah, so that's that's good to know. And they're also trying to plan another one in early February, um, time and place to be determined, but they're trying to line that up. I believe it might land in Waitley, but the, the boards of health are taking the lead on this on this one. So we'll see what happens there. Um, yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell. I'm sure there's probably questions, um, you know, right now on their dashboard, it's kind of very transparent. We did have 41 cases in our district in three days, um, which kind of broke all doesn't break didn't break all the school records, um, but it certainly as a as a whole, um, Deerfield Elementary is doing okay right now. With, is pretty low in comparative to what's happening in the community, which is um, good. Um, there's also you know the the numbers that you see in those in that uh, dashboard is only what's reported to us. Now that the ability that people have the ability to test at home and um, do things like that, and then and then choose not to report to the school, you know those numbers are probably lower than what's actually happening in our school community at each building because people could, and also the way that COVID is affecting different people. You know, I'm hearing stories of people having a slight sniffle coming up positive and that's all they've had to, you know, people being bedridden. Um, yeah, I will say, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy out there about whether or not vaccines work and whether or not the booster works. Um, and locally, from what I've seen in the community, if you've been vaccinated, boosted, it, it's a very mild, um, at least the new, new strain out there has been a very mild, um, occurrence for people who've gotten COVID. So, um, versus those who aren't vaccinated, I'm seeing that just for, it's being reported to me. But so I encourage people to go that route. Trust what trust what you see out there. If you don't trust what you're reading on the back pages of the internet. So yeah, that's where we're at. Okay. So, Darius, I just have a quick question about the logistics of the dashboard. I'm loving it so far. Uh, I'm just curious if. Like, are, are, is everything uploaded across all the schools at one point every day? Like, if I see one school has two cases reported, does that mean every other school has zero so far? Or does it just kind of trickle in over the course of the day? And then our pool testing, is that already in there? Are those results added in there too? And So I added a little asterisk on the today's date to let everybody know it was a pool testing day. So mm -hmm. it was added late in the afternoon today. Oh. Uh, Meg does it, I believe, at the tries to do it in the afternoon. Um, I will say that you know it is, um, you know, it's as accurate as we can make it at the time. So you know, there are times where the school is still tracing down things late into the afternoon. Principals are making phone calls, um, and other contact tracers are making phone calls, and then whoop, they found another one. Oh, you know, you know. Sibling, another sibling's been out, and then we just had another test. And oh, while I have you, let me. Well, I'll tell you that you know we have COVID. You know, so we're getting those kind of things, and those will be added to the dashboard. So it's not a, it's not as strong as what you were getting from the state earlier. The board of health was getting, which was confirmed cases through. This is, you know, some of this is word of mouth because we do allow home testing now. The CDC does a lot, so we do have to go. There is some trust in the community that they're going to tell us. And there's going to be some trust both ways. They're going to tell us when they started so that we can give them proper um, information about when they can come back to school. So, and that's a, that was a decision made above. Them. So whether or not we agree, that's how it should be done. That's how it is. All right. Well, so, those numbers are including the full testing. Um, I think they're pretty good for today. <laughs> pleasantly surprised. It's doing very well, but I'll tell you the numbers in the community are a lot higher. So oh, yes. uh, <laughs> as to, if and when, or people are keeping kids out of school when they're sick, and, and that's, that can be happening too. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, oh, I just had a, a 
a clarifying question. If that does the dashboard now mean that we are not going to get the, um, the messages that we used to get that you were talking about the um, if there, if you anything won't, right, you won't get daily messages. You will be notified if your child was a close contact mm -hmm. um, and you'll get directions at that point. And um, so, yeah, so you're not going to get the daily messages every time there's a new one. Um, so people, I, you know, the report I got and I, I think I would agree people started just to ignore them. And some people felt it was anxiety building. If it wasn't directly mm -hmm. affecting me, we know COVID's out there. So trying to do a balanced approach. At the end of the week, we will do a summary, a summary report out for people to kind of remind people to take a look, um, but not the daily as they come up. And then we'll revisit it. If, if this surge is exactly what we want it to be, a surge and then COVID's over, yes, we can hope. Um, you know, and at the end of the month, all of a sudden we're talking about no cases for or very few cases. And then maybe we will go back to mm -hmm. notifying people the way, you know, based on how they need to be notified based on the information we give them. Sure. So I know I certainly appreciated getting the messages of the pooled testing results. Um, I mean, that's more, I don't know if that is something that, that um, still is going to, or is that part of the dashboard also, the pooled um, test? I'll be honest with you, this is our first week with the dashboard, our first three days <laughs> with the dashboard. And it looks it, great. It, it looks very colorful, unfortunately. It's supposed to look very white across the line, no colored lines going through it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you know, I could talk with principals about maybe we could do, you know, the update there or refer people to. The idea was it's, it's also a lot of work. Um, I'm sure. You know, we don't have a dedicated staff member, but we can, we can find out. Um, okay. Try, we'll take feedback and try to, we want people to have the information, but um, balanced approach there. Sure. Yes. No, that was great. Thank you for thinking of these things. Darius, can I just ask, is it just a student count or is it a building count or it would include staff and faculty as well? B, building count. Building count. Okay. Yep. Thanks. And again, just to re re if we also get notification, they don't have to be, before, like when we reported to the state, like we had a, we had a diagnose in school or we had to have kind of confirmation. Now, if we're making a phone call home and someone said they did a home test and they said they're positive, we're, we're trying to put those numbers in as well. So it's, a, so it's gonna be more numbers because it's a little bit looser gathering, but it gives, again, it's a general idea of what's going on. People should not be, you know, gosh, I heard of two and there's only one in the, in the, in the system today. You know, that's possible. There's also when, not to go on a side chart, but when you get pool tests back, you know, we had a number of pool tests that came back and they weren't all positive. Some of them were retested and they, there was no positive cases or there was an error in how it was packaged. So they make you retest or there was an error in the lab. We don't know what was wrong. We just know there's an error that we have to retest. So there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of those. When we, we send out 149 tubes, um, 140 something, now, 47, 49, something like that. Um, and so, you know, we had 21 tubes come back today or 27 tubes come back today as positives. And some of them were cleared. You know, they tested everybody on site and then didn't find anybody. Um, so there could be several reasons for that, but it could also be that you had a positive that that thing got cleared and didn't come up as a positive later, but that gets really complicated. We won't go down that road. Right. Thank you, Darius. Um, capital improvement plan update. Anything new to report on capital plan? I was actually hoping you were going to report back to us. So I submitted all of them. And right. I don't know where the, the capital improvement committee sits right now, Ken. So we put you on the spot. Have you guys met? Have you made any? Uh, um, the capital improvement committee did meet and uh, we went and did a reorganization and went over the initial items. Uh, so the the plans that were submitted by the school have been noted and put into the plan. <clears throat> um, and uh, we, will, we, we will be meeting much more frequently going into later this month and into February, obviously. So I will provide a feedback on the next meeting, but uh, nothing to report beyond that. They duly acknowledged our requests and um, we'll go from there once, once things clear up. 
<clears throat> so thank you. And Ken, was there any talk about whether or not they were going to be able to, so some of the, um, Shelly, help me with the enactment money. It's, I've lost it. The, the COVID ARPA? money. Was that? Uh, ARPA funds. Yeah, the ARPA funds. When they talk about the ARPA funds being able to address any of the stuff on our list, I did kind of let them know if they were able to address it that way, we wouldn't ask for more. It would just be a different pot of money they could pull it from. Right. They they weren't prepared to fully address that in the meeting. So I, that's, you know, that's kind of why we're still up in the air a little bit, but hopefully, yes, they'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to take care of some of those things with ARPA funds. So for the other members, the ARPA funds, each town was given a lot of money from the, I don't say a lot of, depends on what your me measure of money is, makes the words like a lot, uh, was given money to look at, um, you know, uh, issues that were caused by, by COVID in expenses. And some of our um, capital improvements could be considered, you know, a new, a new dishwasher, sanitization, that kind of stuff might fall under those funds. But right. gonna, you know, looking at where the you know where the town was going to divide up those funds, um, you were kind of putting some of those in, kind of earmarking that you might be able to pay for it a different way, um, rather than going after their you know their free cash or a warrant you know warrant free right. cash. Really. <clears throat> so, yes, it's, um, we've had a lot of upheaval on the on the capital planning committee. Um, so <clears throat> we. Uh, we spent as much time talking about all the various departments in town um, as we did about specifics. So we'll be getting down to, to more of the funding level uh, in the next few meetings. So, so, so that's it. <laughs> um, new business presentation of draft budget for FY23. Um, and I will point out prior to Shelley taking over um, that this is indeed our first look at the budget. I know Julie is, uh, Julie Chalfond is on uh, listening and um, wanted to know what, what we'd be discussing tonight. And this is our first pass and it's our first chance to really take a look and, and ask questions. So it's kind of a, <clears throat> It's the being the first pass. It has all of Tina's needs and thoughts for next year in it, and uh, will obviously be refined over the next two or three meetings prior to our submission to the uh, select board and finance final submission to the select board and finance committee. But with that being said, I'll turn it over to Shelley and Tina and Darius. Great. I'm going to share my screen. I did send you all out um, the report, but I'm going to go ahead and share that so that anyone watching can see. And I think Ken did say exactly what needed to be said. This is kind of, we wanted to show where we start from. Um, we know this needs polishing. It needs to be, um, as you'll see, is a little high. We wanted me to see where we're starting. <laughs> Yes, that is exactly right. So the first draft that we've included here uh, takes into account our um, existing programs, staffing, and level funding. And level funding does, or level service does not necessarily mean level funding. So when we look at the existing staffing and programs, we take any COLA into consideration, whether we're increasing expense accounts because they were underfunded from prior years based on our actuals, or if we take into consideration um, contract uh, negotiations, we are still working on the teacher and the IA contracts, but we build in a placeholder for increases for our teachers and our IAs. Um, we also build in placeholders for any non-union staff, so the support staff at the school, administrative staff, um, central office staff. So all of that stuff is taken into consideration as the first step. Um, and then from there, we do look at new initiatives, um, new staffing that we might need, or new programs for the upcoming year. So this initial draft is higher than we know it needs to be when we um, come to submitting it to the town. Uh, but in order to have transparency and make sure that all of those wants and needs are discussed openly in this forum, um, we do include them in this first draft. 
So after looking at all of those pieces, uh, the first draft of the budget does come in at a 5.23% increase over the prior year. Um, and then we will use another $850,000 roughly of revolving and grant monies to fully fund the operating budget. Um, so we're gonna talk about what that 5.23% makes up because um, I know that that's always a big question of how do we get there. Uh, so as I said, obviously we consider any contract obligations or other COLA increases. Um, can everyone see that or is it too small? Let me make it a little bit bigger. And then, as I said, we look at new initiatives. So there is $60,000 in here for a, a new faculty position. I'll let Tina speak to the importance of that position and why that is included as a want for next year. Um, but it would be in an, uh, on the teacher contract and an instructional coaching position to provide direct support to existing teaching staff. Uh, we also have a uh, $25,000 wage increase to add um, additional time for our certified occupational therapist assistant to move up from 0.4 to 1 FTE, which obviously would provide additional therapy interventions based on student needs. Um, the next bullet point here of an increase of $20,000 in wages for an additional IA is actually not adding a new staff member. However, because we added a staff member this year after the budget was already approved, um, we did have a student who needed uh, some additional services, and I believe in the IEP had a one-to-one, -one, and we did have to provide that for this year. We had savings from other line items and have been able to fund that without having any budgetary constraints this year. However, in 23, it does hit as a full increase to the budget. So um, it's not actually adding a staff person for next year. It's just adding additional money to the budget. Uh, this next bullet point has actually changed slightly. Um, however, I did not change the numbers because this had already gone out to you all. So this will be having a very minor impact. Um, I did explain here we have a $40,000 increase to cover nursing staffing. And one of those uh, factors is the nurse leader position. So that position has gone full time over the last couple of school years. However, it has been primarily funded by a grant that is run through Frontier. This year, the current school year that we're in, the grant is covering less than it has in prior years. Next year, the grant is covering none of that position and it's fully hitting all five of the schools on the budget. So that's a significant portion of this increase. Um, but the second piece of it, Tina and I had originally talked about when we built the first draft, um, moving, there were two part-time nurses at uh, Deerfield this year, our LPN, so we were talking about moving that position to full-time, but my understanding is that that is going to remain um, a part-time 20-hour position, so that'll have a minor change when we come back for the second draft. Um, we are looking to increase uh, wages for summer staffing um, in our summer school program to be able to continue to provide a rigorous and a robust summer program. $20,000 increase to the technology related expenses, and those are not new initiatives. That is simply to properly fund existing software and network expenses. If any uh, school committee member did look at our um, monthly or year to date budget reports, you will see that a lot of the software and network accounts are over budget currently. Um, we tried to make minor increases last year when we built the budget. However, over the last couple of years, we've either changed programming. For instance, we're now using, um, was it Parent Square um, is our new platform to communicate. Well, that has a different price tag than the previous platform that we were using. Um, and there's also other curriculum related software programs that we've added over the last few years. So what I'm trying to do here is write those accounts so that we're not continuously going over budget because they are programs that we want to continue to maintain. Um, and then finally, we are seeing a $9,000 increase to employee separation costs, and that's based on sick buyback payouts due to retirements. So that's over the prior year. Um, and then I did talk about that uh, wage adjustments already. Um, before I keep going, I want to pause and see if anyone has questions or if Tina wants to jump in at all uh, to talk any further about those new faculty and um, CODA positions. Any questions around those positions or? Nothing? Okay. 
Carrie Etchells has her hand up, but I don't actually think I'm supposed to be calling on people, so I'll just mute. <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. I meant to unmute myself. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak more about the instructional coaching position, like what it does and like where, how you're seeing the need for it and our teachers asking for this sort of thing. Great question, Carrie. Yeah, so um, this year our instructional leadership team, which is made up of our full-time teachers and teaching staff, have jumped in to provide some coaching to our new teachers. Um, this We don't have, we are working towards speaking of positively, having a robust, a robust onboarding program for new teachers to get kind of caught up with how we do things in Deerfield, what the curriculum is and instruction and just having that mentor role doesn't seem to be support enough. So this position would do that. But I also see this position um, working directly with students for student, you know, for student impact, particularly around the lagging skills that we're seeing due to COVID. Um, and some of that remote learning. So this position would be working directly with students or teachers, um, mining for gaps, but also supporting new teachers and other teachers in their role. It's going to be a very diverse position. <clears throat> okay. Do you Any see other? other? Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious whether you fear that the other elementary schools in the district will see this and want to poach this person for their new onboarding hires. And is that, does, do you see that as a possibility if that's a, a large part of their role? As being a district? Uh, oh no, so I'm only talking about Deerfield onboarding. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, David. No, 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 I know that's all you're talking about, that it's a Deerfield position, but it sounds like you're saying a big emphasis is on supporting the new teachers, which I suppose there probably are one or two each year. Oh, uh, so. this, yeah, this year we saw kind of, we have oh, I don't know, four new teachers right now, um, but that's not only for that. I think as every year, as we get one or two um, teachers coming in, I can't see your face, so I can't tell if I'm actually answering the question correctly. I need to read your okay. eyes. <laughs> um, no. So I, I guess I'm not sure why what the question is whether where they'd be going to the district no no i just i'm sorry i mean i just heard a large emphasis of of this was on on supporting new teachers so and not just new teachers either so sometimes there's teachers right now um our ilt is working with some veteran teachers that are asking um our coaches or our ilt for support around how do i get this child to move in writing so it could be a support to veteran teachers. It could be a support okay. to um, new teachers, but also mm. working directly with the students as well as in an interventionist role. Okay, great. So more school-wide resource then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, Tina, the last line you didn't emphasize in the beginning, I think that may have got people confused. This, this teacher does work with students. Sorry, yes. Right. Big part of the role would be working directly with students. Um, I noticed the uh, $9,000 increase to the employee separation costs. And can you give us an idea of what the total <laughs> sick leave yeah. buybacks are? Yep. Hold on one second. Let me pull it up. And how many retirements do we have planned for next year? Or are we aware of for next year? So we're looking at an estimate right now of a thirty-one thousand dollar okay. payout. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I don't have the spreadsheet in front of me as far as whether or not that's two staff members or one staff member. My guess is it's two. Mm -hmm. um, it could be even a couple of IAs that I think, if I'm remembering right, um, mm -hmm. gave notice last year, um, and it, and another faculty member. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Last year we had twenty two thousand budgeted, and I it's like thirty thousand five hundred and change is the estimate. That's good. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I can keep going if because yes. there's some data points that um, I want to touch on, and then we can talk about um, next steps. So I'm going to make this a little bit smaller because it's hard to see the whole chart. I think, or it is on my screen at least. Um, 
So I, I threw in a lot of data here for you to look at. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I felt like there were some key points to show everyone. Um, and just uh, this is the breakdown of what the budget increase is comprised of by function code. And function code is something that is set by the state through DESE. They create these categories and we're required to report on them. So this is how we build our budget. So anything in 1000 is administration, which really covers um, business office, superintendent's office, and school committee. 2000 for education and instruction is principal's office and then anyone um, that's considered in a teaching position um, or supplies and materials curriculum related items. 3000 under student services is uh, the health office, so any of our nursing staff. Uh, it also includes transportation, um, student activities, and athletics, although that does not apply to Deerfield, just that would apply to Frontier only. Um, 4,000 operations and maintenance, so that's primarily facilities and IT technology that's not related to curriculum. It's more infrastructure and um, network-based. And then 5,000 is benefits and insurance, which does include the sick buybacks. Um, it does not include benefits that the town pay. Obviously, right. that's separate than, than here. Um, and then 9,000 is our out of district placements. So you can see the percentage there on the far column of what the 5.23% uh, percent makes up. And then I also gave you some data points about the salaries and how those increases compared to non-salary expenditures are impacting the budget. So of the um, total increase, we're looking at almost 79% of that being related to salaries and wages, some of which is from the new positions. That's not strictly um, cost of living adjustments or raises for staff. It does include the new initiatives that we talked about already. So the remaining 55,000 or 56,000 is for non-salary expenditures. And then I wanted to also give you the breakdown of how much of our wages make up the total budget. So the total budget uh, wages are about 78%, and then the remaining 21, 22% or so is um, non-salary expenditures. I also gave you some historical information of what the budget has been at in the past. You can see it's um, varied over the years, but typically, no less than 2.4 over the last few and last year was 3.35. We did have the one year where we did a zero budget increase. We um, level service built that budget but did make cuts or move to other um, funding sources so that we could have a zero increase to the town. And also uh, just a reminder that last year on the town meeting floor we also pulled $50,000 off of the budget to um, bring the number down slightly as well. Not the budget, you mean we pulled the, we also pulled the capital. We pulled the capital, but we did 50,000 for the budget as well. Right. So, right. If, you, if you added in those capital requests onto that budget line or reduced it, you know what I'm saying? Yep. We also reduced mm -hmm. that last year as well. Uh, yeah, and, and I would, you know, the, the total budget you show here is the, total budget submitted to the town it's not the total operating budget correct it's not the five million five point two or uh, that includes grants and no this is just general funds. fund right, just, just general, general fund, fund that impacts the town finances right correct i just just wanted to make that clear to those that are listening for the first time or hadn't seen this particular presentation, that it's just the general fund that's submitted to the town. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Can I just follow up on that, Ken? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Erica. Erica, did you put a hand up? Oh, go ahead. You're muted, Erica. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Um, yeah, if I can just throw in a question. Um, I was just uh wondering about how um the sorry it's not up on the screen now but the is it student services um that were the health department and yeah the 3000 you said health sports which isn't applicable to deerfield and activities and i i wasn't i was kind of looking to see where like 
whether it's in education instruction or in student services or things like um, uh, profession or professional development and um, like social emotional learning aspects of um, of instruction. I wasn't sure like where that kind of stuff gets funded. Like if there's, um, and you know, I know that there was stuff that was going on last year with um, the teachers doing, um, you know, anti-racism instruction and and um, or just learning about anti-racism um, or other, or just even social emotional learning, which I know is in a component of curriculum. I was just wondering if that's something that has an, a different, like where it fits in the budget lines. Um, and if that's something that is um, added, you know, or is it just incorporated in what the, in, in what's already talked about or are there any developments there, or things like that? So anything, uh, in regards to what you're asking about would fall under the 2000 function code. Okay. Um, and you will get a complete budget that has a line by line item as okay. we narrow this down. So you'll be able to see more refined details as okay. we go through our process here. But mm -hmm. all of those things, any um, faculty that are considered support for social emotional or any mm -hmm. other kind of therapy, those kind of things, um, psychologists, uh, guidance counselors, um, mm -hmm. any of our OTPT services, that all falls under the 2000 function code. Professional okay. development for our teachers, whether we're sending them out to a workshop um, mm -hmm. or bringing someone in, no matter what the topic is, that mm -hmm. all also falls under the 2000 function code. Well, cool. and is there any relation between the, um, the, the, that additional staffing um, position and sort of the mentor for things like in terms of um, is that does that include like how they can access professional development and stuff like that or I mean maybe that's details that as you're saying would come from later later um, information I was just curious as to if it's um, it's uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm asking, but I'm, I was just kind of curious as to how how it fits into the sort of the culture of the of this. It sounds like it's something that helps to bolster the the culture and the feeling of camaraderie and 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 um, you know team a team feel, the feeling of a team uh, on on staff. So I was just wondering sort of how that how that uh, gels with with all of the uh, the the great efforts you, you're. Um, you've been making. So I'll wait for details unless okay. you have any others to add now. But thank um, you. I don't have specifics on, on the job description myself, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure Tina could get into greater detail if it is something that we're going to continue to talk about and include mm -hmm. in the budget. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right, so the last piece is I wanted to show you the enrollment data because I think that's also important for us to talk about. The enrollment drives um, the chapter so seven. I ask another budget question oh. before you get into that. I'm sorry. Yep. Sorry to interrupt the flow. That's okay. um, I just wanted to piggyback on uh, what Ken's comment in terms of bringing attention to the fact that we're talking about the general fund and sort of what that increase shows. But can you comment on um, what the percentage increase is? Uh, in terms of the total operating budget for this next budget compared with the last year's? Sure. Because there's that throwaway line of, um, you know, using the additional funds from various revolving funds and grant monies of 870, 40, 846,000. So I'm yep. just wondering when you look at the total budget operating budget, what, what, what kind of percentage are we looking at? Just give me one second to quickly pull both of those up. <clears throat> Um, so last year, the the total expenses, including all funds, uh, or the current year that we're in, 22, um, was 5.5 million. So we're seeing a, you know, almost a $500,000 increase there. Um, so let me get you the exact percentage. So you're you're looking at a well. I got to do everything in Excel, David. If you can do it faster than me, please do. <laughs> I buy so much on Excel these days. Uh, so you're looking at about an eight and a half percent. Eight overall. percent or so, correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just throwing it out there, it's just another um, data point to think about when we think about budgeting in general going forward. <clears throat> um, 
And and as you as you bring that up, David, I notice that when you say a for, total general fund budget of five million two fifty seven, um, if you add eight hundred and forty six thousand to five million two fifty seven, I think. Don't tell me my math is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might add up to a little bit more than five million nine sixty seven. I think see. it's over six million total. Uh oh. You know, you rely on data and technology and see what happens. Used to happen to me all the time. Someone would always come in and mess my spreadsheets up when I went to <laughs> finance committee. So <laughs> uh, let me do this. Let's get it right. You are spot on, Mr. Kodabak. Look at this is the beauty of a live document. There we go. So it's going to be more than eight point. You know, whatever we just talked about, eight point three nine um, for the yeah, total. It's going to be over ten percent. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, it is ten point eight seven. Thank you but for we, catching that. Right. But I'm assuming most of that is grant and uh, and the revolving funds obviously help absorb some of it. Is any of that intended to be? That's not school choice. Um. So it doesn't work. include our school choice allocation okay. as well, which All is right. about four hundred and seventy thousand of that eight forty six. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Very good. All right. Anything else? Right there? Okay. I'll go back to enrollment and then we can continue. Um, enrollment. Okay. So enrollment is important to look at because enrollment drives the chapter 70 funding from the state. Um, it also helps us determine how many sections we're going to have for each grade in the following year um, and how much staffing is needed. Um, so you can see we did have a decline, you know, as expected um, over the last couple of years with the pandemic. However, we are building back up. Um, we're always a year behind in the enrollment numbers. The state uses the prior October numbers in order to build that Chapter 70 formula. Um, so even if our enrollment is higher next year, doesn't matter. We're not going to get any more money <laughs> because they're basing it on the prior year. Um, but I think that this is good data for you all to look at. Um, if you have questions, I'm sure we can can try to answer them. Um, uh, my my main question is, and I know this is you know the first pass. There's there's obviously a couple of classes in here as I was looking at enrollments. Uh, data that was sent to us that are pretty low. I don't know how many class sections are in them, but I noticed the, is it the, you got to get first back. Grade. What's that? I think you're probably looking at first grade with 27. First grade with 27, fourth grade with, no, not fourth grade. Uh, sixth grade is leaving, so, but third grade is it, you know, is that a, borderline number, third going into fourth or whatever. Uh, so it's it's going to be an interesting discussion. Go ahead, Tina. <laughs> First and sixth grade have two sections of class, so I don't know if that's helpful as you're looking at the numbers. Which ones? First and sixth. Our two, two sections, that, two that sections. does help me. <clears throat> Yeah, and enrollment is one of the things that we talk about as part of the budget process, you know, looking at shifting staffing around, um, you know, the si current sixth grade class is smaller than next year's sixth grade class. So right. we have to consider, do we shift it sixth grade into three sections? And, you know, what is the ripple effect from there? Um, and I think at least the three years I've been here, <laughs> this conversation comes up every year as as one of it the does. things we talk about, you know, can we reduce a class? Um, I think we reduced a pre-K class a couple of years ago because the numbers were small and it worked out timing wise because someone was retiring. Um, so it's definitely part of the discussion that Darius, Tina and I are having. Right. So, it, I mean, I'm just bringing it up because it 
you know, it's something that unfortunately we have, you have to work through and you don't get clear answers for another meeting or two. And I know you have to go, go through a whole number of iterations to get, get to the final numbers. But, um, you know, will we, will we be reducing to two sections in more than two classes? It's, it's hard to say. And then you're, then you have to shift your faculty around. I, I understand that, but I just wanted to point out to people that again, we, we've got the, the lower enrollment. So. Yeah. And, it, and when you shift to two sections, you know, not only does it impact the existing staffing and the existing students, but it impacts the amount of school choice students, new cho school choice students that we could take. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, that, that's sort of a catch 22, right? You, you want to make sure you're not pushing school choice so that you're having to add additional staffing, but you also, you know, would like the revenue to come in. So it's a fine, fine balance and an important part of this budget process. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So the only other thing was I just had, you know, here for you to look at what is 1% of the current budget. It's just shy of 50,000 so on and so forth from there. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see everybody better. Um, next steps, you know, obviously, as we started out saying this, Ken and then Darius reiterated that, you know, this is the full wants and needs. If we had no budget restrictions and, and didn't need to tighten the belt, this is what we would be looking at. Um, but we know that we have work to do. So I, I guess the question is right now, um, what kind of guidance does the committee want to give us as the administration moving forward to come back to a meeting in February um, with a lower number, you know, and having an idea of what a goal is. And, um, you know, Ken, I don't know if you have any other insight into where the town is at as well. I, I have, I have no insight as to where the town is at. I mean, there, there are tremendous demands on the town this year and, and going forward. Um, I don't know if Julie's still on, but if she wanted, to, if she wanted to say anything about what might be happening, you're more than welcome to, Julie. <laughs> I'm kind of happy enough to let you all um, work your way through it, but uh, you're right. There are there's a number of things that the town would like to do this year. One area, a, a lot of it is capital expenses, so that doesn't really apply to the general operating fund. Um, but there is one area that the town has been very lacking in in past years which is maintenance, the maintenance budget for the town buildings. And there's a definite recognition that more funding is required, that we are not keeping up with maintenance. Um, and so that's one area that we would hope to be able to put money in, but, you know, it, everybody's in the same spot you are. If you, you know, if you ask, where do you take it away? Um, mm -hmm. But, well, thank you. And, and, Thank you for listening in tonight to get a sense as to how we start and what we're looking yeah. at. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, so I mean, I obviously this is the the starting point. Um, my hope would be that we would be down, you know, in terms of a quote percentage increase. I hate always having to deal just in percentage numbers as opposed to services, et cetera, but. The fact that you have some services, you know, upticks and it's not just a level budget that there are some new services in here. Um, I'm hoping that we can we can work towards providing those services <clears throat> and, and still, you know, have the impact on the town budget that we have tried to strive to have over the last five to ten years and, and stay in that two and a half percent to three percent range for our requests, so I just that's had, just me. Sorry. Go ahead. I just um, wanted to, uh, to cl clarify, to understand um, the zero amount for the out of district tuition. What does that, what just, what does that mean? If 
I, I, Shelley, do you know? So the out of district tuition is any student that we service outside of Deerfield Elementary. So it's special education students that are town residents that we have to place in another school, whether it's a another Massachusetts public school or a collaborative or a private program. We actually do have out of district placements. Um, when you see the full spreadsheet, and this is not new, this is a recurring expense. We've had students going out of district for some years. We pay for it currently um, from school choice funds, which is actually a good place to pay for that type of expense because it's one of those expenses that fluctuates year to year depending on what students go in or out of the district. It, oh, so it just, hits the budget though. That's why you see the zero there. Gotcha. Okay. Because I was confusing it with like if it was students who decided to go to other schools. It's, no, not, no. That, it's not. It's just special education services. Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the 3,000 line, the 15% increase, but I'm thinking that health and transportation, that's got to be a lot of inevitable increases currently, correct? So the primary increase for that is twofold. One, um, that part-time position that I talked about, that we have two part-time LPNs this year, and Tina and I had talked about moving that full-time. So that'll actually come down a little bit because that is going to stay at 20 hours. Um, and the other big impact there is the nurse leader position that's fully hitting budget this year. Um, our transportation is not expected to increase for regular transportation. Um, and Deerfield's uh, special education transportation, I don't think is expected to go up significantly over the current budget amount either. It's it's primarily driven by that nurse leader position. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. A anything else? Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Shelly and Tina and Darius and all others that participate in the in the budgeting process, um, it's a it's a it's a good start, and I look forward to to the uh, continued iterations as we move forward. So, thanks. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda would be acceptance of a gift from the Yankee Candle Company. Tina mentioned it in her report. Um, I believe it was a ten thousand dollar donation. Is that correct? Or no, not that. I mean, not ten thousand. <laughs> Five? I can't remember what it was. Four. I have a four. We have four thousand. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, but uh, they do continue. Yankee Candle does continue to support the schools and has done that throughout their time in the town of Deerfield. So. Um, I would like to see if we could acknowledge and accept the gift of $4,000 for the uh, Deerfield Elementary School. And uh, we would acknowledge it as a school committee back. I know it's already need a motion. acknowledged, but yes. Yes. Uh, so moved. Second. Um, any further discussion? Yeah, Ken, I just want to throw in there that uh, just so that those viewing, Yankee Kale gave $4,000 to Frontier and also to Wheatley Elementary, where they also have a um, you know, shop in, in Wheatley as well. Um, they also gave um, $1,500 worth of scholarships to $1,500 per student for 16 Frontier graduates. Wow. So um, yes. it's more than, been, this is just a part of their generosity to the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else? If not, we'll proceed to a roll call vote. Ken Cutterback, yes. <clears throat> Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Uh, Mary Raymond? Yes. And Erica Jacob? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, we're down to reports. Uh, <clears throat> the committee chair has no <laughs> nothing to report. I know Erica sent uh, the um, collaborative summary annual reports. Uh, I know some of us had received it, or maybe all of us received it directly from the 
collaborative as well. But um, it's it's always nice to get the get the information, um, and then superintendent. Um, just to uh, jump on, there's only two other small things that are going on. Well, not small things that are going on, but we have quick things to say. Uh, we are in the middle of the contract negotiations, um, and we are our next meeting is next week um, on the 12th. And um, right now, you know, we're both sides are working together and we're uh, making progress. So very pleased about that. And um, there is no real anti-racism equity committee report this this month, but um, their next committee meeting is uh, February 9th. And the community dialogue series that um, Jen Smith talked about is going to continue on February 17th. And she'll be on at our next meeting to talk a little bit, kind of remind her what's going on there and give us an update there. So those are the other two things that were on my report. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you. I, there, were, there is no need for executive session. As Darius said, the contract negotiations are, are proceeding, but there's nothing substantive to talk about and no updates on the other any other issues. So we do not need executive session this evening. So that brings us down to adjournment. If someone would care to make a motion. A motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Multiple seconds. Nice. I'll give it to Erica Very a eager. second. <laughs> um, we will go to a roll call vote on adjournment. Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Erica Jacob? Yes. And Ken Cutterback? Yes. We are officially adjourned at 7.04 p.m.